We are carrying on with our section on scheduling and time estimation on projects and in the previous video we talked a little bit about how project managers go about thinking about the time necessary on each task. Now a lot of it comes just from expertise and experience and part of it comes into thinking about what's an optimistic versus what's a realistic, what's a and what's a pessimistic outlook on being able to accomplish a task within a certain time frame. Once we have thought through our work plan and done that, we start to make a visual representation. So we're going to walk through some of the different visual representations of work plans and how they help facilitate um, scheduling and planning of activities in today's lecture. So. Part four, planning our timeline. At the end of this video, you'll be able to take your work plan and convert it into a Gantt chart, a flow diagram, and a critical path method diagram, or um, I've heard it called PERT charts as well. Um, there's a few different terminologies, and we are going to be doing a CPM diagram in particular. So I'm going to flip over to the work plan just to give us our frame of reference here. So you may remember the collaborative work plan that we had done in the first week, and that's where we set what the goals of the project were going to be and who our team members were going to be. And in there we worked out a simple work plan and we made some really high level estimations about how much time it was going to take. For example, here on week one, we're sort of blocking out the time in which we're going to do the project, but it shouldn't take us one week to do a site visit. Optimistically, it should take us one day, and realistically, it's likely going to take us two days. Why? It's going to take half a day to do the planning and get permissions and file any paperwork with, with, um, within our team. It's going to take one day to do the site visit, and then a little bit of time to do the reporting. So realistically, it's going to take us two days, and pessimistically, you could say, well, wait a second, what about scheduling issues and maybe our industry client is in heavy production and they have to delay it by a couple of weeks. Maybe pessimistically it will take us 10 days to plan the site visit, even though realistically it really should only take us one day. Um, these are the sorts of questions that you start to ask at this level. You want to go through each of those tasks and think about what's a What's the bare minimum time necessary for absolute optimistic time frame? What's a realistic time frame? And then what's a pessimistic time frame on each of these different tasks? From there, we're going to draw it out in a sketch into a bit of a flowchart. And so I think I can actually flip this one quite easily. I actually did this on my screen whiteboard and I have a Wacom board so I could scribble on the board. But I wanted to go through each of those different tasks and sketch out, here's the site visit, here's our recreate the formula, design of experiments, and so on. And I wanted to start to see this sort of dependency of activities that were going on. And fortunately for us, this is a reasonably linear project, and it's nice on a first time when doing a uh, PERT chart or a critical path model to have a reasonably linear uh, pattern. It will, it will be straightforward, and doing some of the calculations will be You'll kind of scratch your head and go, why am I doing this on this linear path? But later on, we'll have much more nonlinear paths, and then it will make more sense that you have done some simple ones first, then go into more complicated ones. So we drafted out this, and from there, um, we're going to overlay this into a Excel file. So I did an Excel file. Actually, I should jump in and show you the Gantt chart. I gave you a template for... Um, using for Gantt charts. And honestly, this course is not about, pardon me, this course is not about programming Excel. It's about organizing your thought processes behind um, process engineering, and in particular in this section on project management. So I do not want you to go and necessarily make an, a Gantt chart from scratch. I want you to take a realistic but basic project and overlay it into a Gantt chart so that you can show me that you can think through how to organize 
the process. I like this Gantt chart and I gave you the, the source template and I also gave you the source video from which um, this uh, template was made. And what I like about it is it's nice and crisp and clean. You can organize activities by day, not just by week, but by day. And there's also a function where you can track your progress. So maybe on the site visit we're done, maybe on the recreation of the formula we're done, but here on our experimental design, we can adjust the percent of the tasks that's being done. And having this capability of tracking progress and completion of tasks is really nice. When you go into um, team meetings or scrum sessions, you can open up your, per, or, uh, your Gantt chart, pardon me, you open up your Gantt chart and you can talk to the different team members and say, hey, Ezio, where are you at on this task? And Ezio can say, well, you know what? I've ordered in uh, 10 different ingredients and I've only received three of them. Well, then you'd say, okay, perhaps we're at 30%. And then you say, where are we at in terms of bench production trials? Well, we've been able to recreate the formula and based off of the ingredients that we have, we are roughly 40% done, but we're waiting on the ingredients that are waiting here. What we just talked about here is a dependent activity. So when, when you can't move ahead on something here because you need a prior activity to be done, you have dependency in your activities. So it looks like there's overlap, but there's actual dependency here. And you can't move ahead on these future activities until the first activities are completed. So it's nice to have this visual to say each of these tasks are in progress they're partially completed or they're fully completed. And I like that on this, on this Gantt chart that you can track that in a really high impact visual. So we have the Gantt chart, we did our rough flow chart and on that flow chart from there, we, I, I, did, I did it in multiple stages here. What I initially did was just block out those blocks and I put it in a three by three and there's a reason why. And I'm, I just more or less mapped out the same principle that was there before. And I'm actually, pardon me, I'm going to jump ahead to the version here because what I wanted to show you was three by three just happens to be nice and tidy for mapping out the different elements that are used in the critical path mapping. So the first time around, you are going to fill out the early start, the duration, and the early finish. So you're doing a forward pass on this activity. So the site visit, we're going to go with the optimistic timeframes here. So site visit, it starts at time zero. We say it's going to run for a duration of one day. And so it ends on day one. From there, we can jump up to, we start on day one. It's going to take, whoa, wait a second. It says, oh no, I may have mapped this out incorrectly. So I think... I, oh, no, you know what? I had it at one day, but I had I had adjusted these numbers up and down. So that's ending on day two. So we start on day one. It takes us one day, and therefore we end on day two. On this activity, which is activity C, design of experiments, let's say it takes two days. So we start on day one, it takes us two days, and we end on day three. Here we have activity um, of procuring ingredients. So we start on day one. And it's going to take 10 days. Uh, quite often you call up those suppliers and they say, okay, two business weeks and we'll get it to you, no problem. So that's 10 days. So start on day one, 10 days later, we're at day 11. Now here's where it's interesting because these are parallel activities that they can take place sort of simultaneously, but moving forward, we can't jump into activity E, into the initial production trial, until all of these activities are complete. So which is our start day? Well, it happens to be the last day. We can't start until everything's received here. So we're at day 11 in terms of the dependency. So day 11, let's say we have five days for production. So 11 plus five is 16, and we move forward. 16 plus one, and so this is our client tasting. So 16 plus one is 17. Now at that client tasting point, in my initial whiteboard, I had just said procure ingredients once. And wait a second, I really, as I was thinking about this, wait a second, the, 
the client tastes it and says, well, I'd like to do this flavor, or man, the texture's off, I'd like to try this functional ingredient. We may have to go back and retouch that for cure ingredients. And so, wait a second, we have that 10 days de lag time in there again. So we went from day 17, 17 plus 10, and going into the next production run, if we need to have that procurement activity, we can't move ahead. If there's no procurement activity, we could be starting at day 17 and so on. But because we've got 10 days lag, we've got to go to 27 as our start date, five days for production at day 32. Now, this is a recreate the formula, the original formula from a, from a baseline comparison perspective. So one day for that, and that puts us at day 33 here. Day 33, we're doing a tasting, and the client approves. We may have to go back to procurement again. I put these as an offshoot because I'm, you're going to see in a moment. So we're at day 34. Day 34 plus 10 is day 44. Day 44 is our, is our day up here because we can't go straight from the client tasting to the scale-up trial because we're making the assumption that we have to go and order the ingredients in bulk. So we need that 10 day leg time. And we're at day 44 plus two on our production scale up. And we're at day 46. Day 46 plus four for reporting. And we're at day 50. Now if we go back to our chart here, we said it was going to take us approximately 10 to 11 weeks. And that's approximately correct. Based off of the forward pass here, we are at 10 weeks which is a good job. Now we have to do a backwards pass to see where are these activities dependent. So we're going to start with the day here and we're going to subtract the duration, four. Now here we're going to subtract our early start and our late start to see if we have any slack in that time. And in this case we have no slack in the time. Moving backwards, so we're moving um, late start into this corner, so late finish and Late start minus duration, 46 minus 2 is 44, so again, we have no slack in there. 44 minus 10 is 34, no slack in there. And we've got 34 moving up here, no slack in there. 32 minus 5 is 20, uh, pardon me, 27, and 27, we're moving the late finish here because we have to think backwards in our dependency as well. 27 minus 10 is 17. 17 minus 116. Note, we do not have a lot of slack in this project at all. And so we have to run absolutely meticulously on the nose when it comes to time. Now, the only places we do have some slack here are up in the recreation of the original formula and in the design of experiments. But if you think about it, the procurement of these ingredients is actually somewhat dependent on the design of experiments. And you could, in theory, say it's actually linear to that. Now, let, I just wanted to, uh, everywhere that it was zero slack, I highlighted it. That means that these activities absolutely, absolutely, absolutely must move on schedule. And they cannot be budged by any means in terms of the, the timing to be able to get that project done by day 50. And as such, it's really, really critical to stay on schedule and complete everything on target. I put red here in particular. These are highlighted zero, but I want to put out an alternative scenario into the world here. What would happen if, as a product developer, you ordered everything in anticipation and you thought really robustly about the entire experimental design and only ordered once here? So 50 days finish time here. Let's jump into alternative scenario here. If we ordered absolutely, absolutely everything in advance, and so we made out a larger bulk order, this is, this is something worth noting. We make a larger bulk order of our ingredients on the front end, and we make our product once. We make our reference product once here in B, and we do not repeat making that reference product here in B. Now our project is 20 days shorter. And if you consider, let's say you're paying out the team. If you remember, we're going out, how many team members? We've got four employees here. Let's, let's say these are four, 
there's me in there, so don't count me. But let's say it's uh, three, well, let's see, two of these are co-op students. So just the salary on two co-op students. Let's jump back to our calculator here. So how much are we going to pay our co-op students? 15 bucks an hour? 15 bucks an hour times 35 times 2 times, so that was a difference of 20 days. So how many, uh, so time, so I'm doing this by week. 20 days is 4 weeks times times 4. So $4,200. Note, if we were to order everything that we anticipate doing this entire for, for this entire project in advance, we are going to save from a throughput perspective $4,200 on salary that we can reassign these students to do something else. And so these sorts of project plans can help you identify where are absolutely critical activities that need to be done and help you think through the cost of doing these different activities. Four thousand two hundred. Let's let's say we bought five hundred dollars worth of more supplies here. Well, it looks like an upfront cost. We are increasing our throughput, and the throughput of projects is absolutely, absolutely going to be one of the most critical measures that we look at, and we will spend more time on throughput measurements in our next week's session on theory of constraints. But what we did by doing this mapping was we found the areas where we had the most constraint and we were able to subordinate the work and be able to identify how can we reduce that time constraint. How else could we do it? We could find a supplier that maybe doesn't take 10 business days to get to us. We could be asking the question, hey supplier, could you get it to us in by express courier? And while we may be paying more upfront for express courier, we are not having the same time frame to be able, to, and we are shrinking down that project and the cost of labor is going to decrease. These are the sorts of questions that are going to consistently come up and therefore the reason why we want to be doing these sorts of charts. So have fun. Your assignment is to take your chart from week one and overlay it into a chart of this form in week two. You know where to ask questions. I always enjoy hearing from you. Take care and we'll talk soon.